Hey everyone. So, I'm just going to do a follow up looking into the origins of the International Working Men's Association, which, as we talked about before, became eventually the Communist International. And the commun- I mean, the IWA was founded by George Odger, Omri, Tolane, Edward Spencer, Beasley, and its purpose was defense of the working class, class struggle against capitalism, and establishment of a socialist society. So in Europe, there was a harsh reaction following the widespread revolutions of 1848. And then 20 years later was the next revolutionary action, the founding of the IWA in 1864. And it eventually split over conflicts between statist and anarchist factions. And its origins were following the January uprising in Poland in 1863, French and British workers started to discuss developing a closer relationship Henri Tolaine, Joseph Perricon, Charles Limousin visited London in July 1863, attending a meeting in St. James's Hall in honour of the Polish uprising. They discussed the need for an international organisation, which would, amongst other things, prevent the import of foreign workers to break strikes. In September 64, French and British delegates again met in London, this time to set up an organisation for sharing labour information across borders. But the, so the January uprising in Poland is where we're going. The January uprising was an insurrection principally in Russia's kingdom of Poland aimed at the restoration of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It began on 22nd of January 1863 and continued until the last insurgents were captured by the Russian forces in 1864. There's a really cool picture here of the January Uprising, part of the Polish-Russian War, titled Polonia, 1863, by Jan Mateczko. Pictures of the aftermath of the failed January 1863 Uprising. Captives await transportation to Siberia. Russian officers and soldiers supervise a blacksmith placing shackles on a woman, Polonia. The blonde girl next to her represents Lithuania. Belligerents, Polish national government and multicultural insurgents, Garibaldi Legion versus the Russian Empire. As a map of the administrative divisions of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth within the pre-partition borders of 1772, introduced by the national government during the January uprisings in 1863. It was the longest lasting insurgency in, Pol- in post-partition Poland. The conflict engaged all levels of society and arguably had profound repercussions on contemporary international relations and ultimately provoked a social and ideological paradigm shift in national events that went on to have a decisive influence on the subsequent development of Polish society. It was the confluence of a number of factors that rendered the uprising inevitable in early 1863. The Polish nobility and urban bourgeois circles hankered after the semi-autonomous state they had enjoyed in Congress Poland before the previous insurgency, a generation earlier in 1830, while youth, encouraged by the success of the Italian independence movement, urgently desired the same outcome. Russia had been weakened by its Crimean adventure and had introduced a more liberal attitude in its internal politics, which encouraged Poland's underground national government to plan an organised strike against their Russian occupiers no earlier than the spring of 1863. They had not reckoned with Alexander Wielopolsky, the pro-Russian arch-conservative, head of the civil administration in the Russian partition, who got wind of the plans. Wielopolsky was aware that his fellow countrymen's Fervent desire for independence was coming to a head, something he wanted to avoid at all costs. 
In an attempt to derail the Polish national movement, he brought forward to January the conscription of young Polish activists into the Imperial Russian Army for 20 years service. That decision is what triggered the January uprising of 1863, the very outcome Wielopolski had wanted to avoid. The rebellion by young Polish conscripts was soon joined by high-ranking Polish-Lithuanian officers and members of the political class. The insurrectionists, as yet ill-organized, were severely outnumbered and lacking sufficient foreign support and were forced into hazardous guerrilla tactics. Reprisals were swift and ruthless. Public executions and deportations to Siberia eventually persuaded many Poles to abandon armed struggle. In addition, Tsar Alexander II hit the landed gentry hard and as a result the whole economy with a sudden decision in 1864 to finally abolish serfdom in Poland. The ensuing breakup of estates and destruction, destitution of many peasants convinced educated Poles to turn instead to the idea of organic work, economic and cultural self-improvement. Lead up to the uprising. Picture of Russian army in Warsaw during martial law, 1861. And painting the battle from the cycle of paintings, Bologna, dedicated to January uprising of 1863, Artur Grotker. Despite the Russian Empire losing the Crimean War and being weakened economically and politically, Alexander II warned in 1856 against further concessions with the words, Forget any dreams. There were two prevailing streams of thought among the population of the Kingdom of Poland at the time, one consisting of patriotic stirrings within liberal conservative, usually landed and intellectual circles centred around Andrzej Zamoyski. They were hoping for an orderly return to the constitutional status pre-1830. They became characterised as the Whites. The alternative tendency characterised as the Reds, represented a democratic movement uniting peasants, workers and some clergy. For both streams, central to their dilemma was the peasant question, the PQ. However, estate owners tended to favour the abolition of serfdom in exchange for compensation, whereas the democratic movement saw the overthrow of the Russian yoke as entirely dependent on unconditional liberation of the peasantry. Just as the Democrats organised the first religious and patriotic demonstrations in 1860, covert resistance groups began to form among educated youth. Blood was first shed in Warsaw in February 1861 when the Russian army attacked demonstration in Castle Square on the anniversary of the Battle of Grokov. There were five fatalities. Fearing the spread of spontaneous unrest, Alexander II reluctantly agreed to accept a petition for a change in the system of governance. Ultimately, he agreed to the appointment of Alexander Wielopolski to head a commission to look into religious observance and public education and announced the formation of a state council and self-governance for towns and powiats. These concessions did not prevent further demonstrations. On 8th of April, there were 200 killed and 500 wounded by Russian fire. Martial law was imposed in Warsaw and brutally repressive measures were taken against the organisers in Warsaw and Vilna by deporting them into deepest Russia. In Vilna alone, 116 demonstrations were held during 1861. In the autumn of 1861, Russians had introduced a state of emergency in Vilna Governorate, Kovno Governorate and Grodno Governorate. These events led to a speedier consolidation of the resistance. Future leaders of the uprising gathered secretly in St. Petersburg, Warsaw, Vilna, Paris and London. Two bodies emerged from these consultations. By October 1861, the Urban Movement Committee was formed and in June 1862 the Central Nationalist Committee came into, came into being. Its leadership included Stefan Bobrovsky, Jaroslav Dabrovsky, Zygmunt Padlovsky, Agaton Gila and Branislav Swarth. This body directed the creation of a national structure intended to become a new secret Polish state. The CNC had not planned an uprising before the spring of 1863 at the earliest. However, Wielopolski's move to start conscription to the Russian army in mid-January forced its hand to call the uprising prematurely on the night of 22 to 23 January 1863. Call to arms in the Kingdom of Poland. Picture map battles of January uprising 
in Congress, Poland, and Marian Langewicz. The uprising broke out at a moment when general peace prevailed in Europe, and although there was vociferous support for the Poles, powers such as France, Britain, and Austria were unwilling to disturb international calm. The revolutionary leaders did not have sufficient means to arm and equip the groups of young men who were hiding in forests to escape Alexander Vilopolsky's order of conscription into the Russian army. Initially, about 10,000 men rallied around the revolutionary banner. The volunteers came chiefly from city working classes and minor clerks, although there was also a significant number of the younger sons of poorer Shlakta nobility and a number of priests of lower rank. Initially, the Russian government had at its disposal an army of 90,000 men under Russian General Anders Edvard Ramsey in Poland. It looked as if the rebellion might be crushed quickly. Undeterred by the CNC's provisional government issued a manifesto in which it declared all sons of Poland are free and equal citizens without distinction of creed, condition or rank. It decreed that land cultivated, cultivated by the peasants, whether on the basis of of rent or service henceforth should become their unconditional property and compensation for it would be given to the landlords out of state general funds. The provisional government did its best to send supplies to the unarmed and scattered volunteers during the month of February, had fought in 80 bloody skirmishes with the Russians. Meanwhile, the CNC issued an appeal for assistance to the nations of Western Europe which was received everywhere with supportive sentiments from Norway to Portugal. Italian, French and Hungarian officers answered the call. Pope Pius IX ordered special prayers for the success of the Catholic Poles in their defence against the Orthodox Russians and was generally active in raising support for Polish rebellion. By late spring, early summer of 1863, historian Jerzy Zrada records there were 35,000 Poles under arms facing a Russian army of 145,000 in the Polish kingdom alone. Uprising spreads to former Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Map showing battles of January uprising, Eastern Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Belarus and Ukraine. And a crest, the January uprising is coat of arms of a proposed Polish, Lithuanian, Ruthenian Commonwealth, White Eagle, Poland, Vitis, Lithuania and Archangel Michael, Ruthenia. On February the 1st, 1863, the uprising erupted in Lithuania. During April and May, it had spread to Dynaberg, Latvia, and Witebsk, Belarus, to the Kiev governorate, northern Ukraine, and to the Volnian voivodeship. Volunteers, weapons, and supplies began to flow in over the borders from Galicia in the Austrian partition and from the Prussian partition. Volunteers also arrived from Italy, Hungary, France, and from Russia itself. The greatest setback was that in spite of liberation manifesto from the KCN without prior ideological agitation, the peasantry could not be mobilized to participate in the struggle, except in those regions that were dominated by Polish units, which saw a gradual enrollment into the uprising of agricultural workers. The secret state. The secret Polish state was directed by the Rada Narodowa, RN National Council, to which the civil and military structures on the ground were accountable. It was a virtual coalition government formed of the Reds and the Whites. It was led by Zygmunt Sierakowski, Antanas Makovicius and Konstanty Kalanowski. The latter two supported their counterparts in Poland and adhered to common policies. Its diplomatic corps was centred on Paris under the direction of Vladislav Sartorsky. The eruption of armed conflict in the former Commonwealth of Two Nations had surprised Western European capitals. Even if public opinion responded with sympathy for the rebel cause, it had dawned on Paris, London, Vienna, as well as on St. Petersburg that the crisis could plausibly turn into a new war with Russia. For their part, Russian diplomats considered the uprising an internal matter, while European stability was generally predicated on the fate of Poland's aspiration. International repercussions, picture of Napoleon III, 1865, picture of Vladislav Satorysky. The uncovering of the existence of the Alvinsleben Convention signed on 8th of February 1863 by Prussia and Russia in St. Petersburg to jointly suppress the Poles, internationalized the uprising. 
It enabled Western powers to take the diplomatic initiative for their own ends. Napoleon III of France, already a sympathiser with Poland, was concerned to protect its border on the Rhine and turned his political guns on Prussia with a view to provoking a war with it. He was simultaneously seeking an alliance with Austria. The United Kingdom, on the other hand, sought, a pre sought to prevent a Franco-Prussian war and to block an Austrian alliance with France and looked to scupper any rapprochement between France and Russia. Austria was competing with Prussia for leadership of the German territories, but rejected French approaches for an alliance. Spurring any support for Napoleon III, spurning any support for Napoleon III as acting against German interests. There was no discussion of military intervention on behalf of the Poles, despite Napoleon's support for the continuation of the insurgency. France, the United Kingdom and Austria agreed a diplomatic intervention in defence of Polish rights and in April issued diplomatic notes that were intended to be no more than persuasive in tone. The Polish RN was hoping that the evolution of the insurgency would ultimately push Western powers to adopt an armed intervention, which was the flavour of Polish diplomatic talks with those powers. The Polish line was that the establishment of a continued peace in Europe was conditional of the return of an independent Polish state. With the threat of war averted, St. Petersburg left the door open for negotiations, but was adamant in its rejection of any Western rights to armed conflict. In June 1863, Western powers iterated the conditions, an amnesty for the insurgents, the creation of a national representative structure and the development of autonomous concessions across the kingdom, a recall of a Conference of Congress of Vienna, 1815, signatories and a ceasefire for its duration. This fell well below the expectations of the leadership of the uprising. While concerned by the threat of war, Alexander II felt secure enough with the support of his people to reject the proposals. Although France and the UK were insulted, they did not proceed with further interventions which enabled Russia to extend and finally break off negotiations in September 1863. Outcome on the ground, picture of Andrioli, the death of Ludwig Narbut. Apart from the efforts of Sweden, diplomatic interventions by foreign powers on behalf of Poland were on balance unhelpful in drawing attention away from the aim of Polish national unity towards its social divisions. It alienated Austria, which hitherto had maintained a friendly neutrality towards Poland and had not interfered with Polish activities in Galicia. It prejudiced public opinion among radical groups in Russia who until then had been friendly because they regarded the uprising as a social rather than a national insurgency, and it stirred the Russian government into an ever more brutal suppression of hostilities and repression against its Polish participants that had grown in strength. In addition to the thousands who fell in battle, 128 men were hanged under the personal supervision of Mikhail Muravyov, Muravyov, the hangman, and 9,423 men and women were exiled to Siberia, 2,500 men according to Russia's own estimates. The historian Norman Davies gives the number as 80,000, noting it was the single largest deportation in Russian history. Whole villages and towns were burned down, all economic and social activities were suspended, and the Shlakta was ruined through confiscation of property and exorbitant taxes. Such was the brutality of Russian troops that their actions were condemned throughout Europe. Count Fyodor Berg, the newly appointed governor Namisnik of Poland, and successor to Moraviov, employed harsh measures against the population and intensified system, systematic Russification in an effort to eradicate Polish traditions and culture. Social divisions laid bare. Insurgents of landed background constituted 60% of the uprising's participants. In Lithuania and Belarus, around 50%. In Ukraine, some 75%. During the first 24 hours of the uprising, armories across the country were looted and many Russian officials were executed on site. 2nd of February 1863 saw the start of the first major military engagement of the uprising between Lithuanian peasants mostly armed with scythes and a squadron of Russian hussars outside Sistabuda near Marijampol. It ended with the massacre of the unprepared peasants. While there was still hope of a short war, insurgents groups merged into bigger formations and recruited new volunteers. 
Evolution of events. Warning, this section needs additional citations for verification. Painting, Zouaves of Death, an 1863 uprising unit organized by Francois Rochebrun by K. Sariusk Volsky from a photograph from left. Count Wojciech, Komarovsky, Colonel Rochebrun and Lieutenant Tenant Bella. The provisional government had counted on an insurgency erupting in Russia where wide discontent and with the autocratic regime seemed to be brewing at the time. It also counted on the active support of Napoleon III, particularly after Prussia, expecting the inevitable armed conflict with France, had made overtures to Russia sealed in the Alvensleben Convention and offered assistance in suppressing the Polish uprising. Arrangements had already been completed on the 14th of February and the British ambassador to Berlin, Sir Alexander Mallet, was able to inform his government that a Prussian military envoy has concluded a military convention with the Russian government, according to which the two governments will reciprocally afford facilities to each other for the suppression of the insurrectionary movements which have lately taken place in Poland and Lithuania. The Prussian railways are also to be placed at the disposal of the Russian army, military authorities for the transportation of troops through Prussian territory from one part of the former Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to another. This step by Bismarck led to protests from several governments and incensed to several constituent nations from the, of the former Commonwealth. The result was the transformation of a relatively insignificant uprising into another national war against Russia. Encouraged by promises made by Napoleon III, all the provinces of the erstwhile Commonwealth, acting on the advice of Vladislav Kastorsky, had taken to arms. Moreover, to indicate their solidarity, all Commonwealth citizens holding office under the Russian government, including the Archbishop of Warsaw, Zeman Felinski, resigned their positions and signed their allegiance to the newly constituted government, which was composed of the five most prominent representatives of the Whites. The Reds, meanwhile, criticised the Polish national government for being reactionary with its policy to incentivize Polish peasants to fight in the uprising. The government justified its inaction on the back of the hopes of foreign military intervention promised by Napoleon III. It never materialized. Romald Traugut. It was only after Polish General Romald Traugut took matters into his own hands on 17th of October 1863 to unite all classes under a single national banner that the struggle could be upheld. His restructuring and preparation for an offensive in spring 1864 was banking on a European-wide war. On 27 December 1863, he enacted a decree of the former provisional government by granting peasants the land they worked. This land was to be provided by compensating the owners through state funds after the successful conclusion of the uprising. Traugut called on all Polish classes to rise against Russian oppression for the creation of a new Polish state. The response was moderate since the policy came too late. The Russian government had already begun working among peasants, granting them generous parcels of land for the asking. Those peasants who had been bought off did not engage with Polish revolutionaries to any extent, nor did they provide them with support. Fighting continued intermittently during the winter of 1863-4 to on the southern edge of the kingdom near the Galician border, from where assistance was still forthcoming. In late December, in the Lublin Vovoid ship, General Mikhail Hegendreich's unit was overwhelmed. The most determined resistance continued in the Swiatorkreski hills, where General Joseph Hauk Bosak distinguished himself by taking several cities from the vastly superior Russian forces. Yet he too succumbed to a crushing defeat on 21st of February 1864, which presaged the end of the armed struggle. On 29th of February, Austria imposed martial law and on the 2nd of the March, the Tsarist authorities brought, brought in the abolition of serfdom in the Polish kingdom. These two events neutralised Traugut's concept of developing the uprising with a general mobilisation of the population in the Russian partition and reliance on assistance from Galicia. In April 1864, Napoleon III abandoned the Polish cause. Vladislav Karotiski wrote to Traugut, We are alone, and alone we shall remain. 
Arrests decimated key positions in the secret Polish state, while those who felt threatened sought refuge abroad. Traugott was taken on the night of 10th of April after he and the last four members of the National Council, Antoni Jezeranski, Rafael Krajewski, Józef Tokiski and Roman Zulinski had been apprehended by Russian troops. They were imprisoned and executed by hanging on 5th of August at the Warsaw Citadel. It marked the symbolic closure of the uprising. Only Alexander Vazkowski, head of the Warsaw insurgency, eluded the police till December 1864, but then he too joined the list of the lost in February 1865. The war, consisting of 650 battles and skirmishes with 25,000 Polish and other insurgents killed, had lasted 18 months. It is worthy of note that the insurgency persisted in Samogitia and Podlesi, where the Greek Catholic population outraged and, and persecuted for their religious observance, Kriaki, those baptised into the Greek Orthodox Church, and others like commander and priest Stanislav Brozka, clung longest to the revolutionary banner until the spring of 1865. The Decades of Reprisals Picture of Malkowski, Christmas Eve in Siberia After the collapse of the uprisings, harsh reprisals followed. According to the official Russian information, 396 persons were executed and 18,672 were exiled to Siberia. Large numbers of men and women were sent to the interior of Russia and to the Caucasus Urals and other remote areas Altogether, about 70,000 persons were imprisoned and subsequently exiled from Poland and consigned to distant regions of Russia. The abolition of serfdom early in 1864 was deliberately enacted in a move designed specifically to ruin the Shlakta. The Russian government confiscated 1,660 estates in Poland and 1,794 in Lithuania. A 10% income tax was imposed on all estates as war indemnity. Only in 1869 was the tax reduced to 5% on all incomes. It was the only time when peasants paid the market price for redemption on the land. The average for the Russian Empire was 34% above the market price. All land taken from Polish peasants since 1864 was to be returned without compensation rights. Former serfs could only sell land to other peasants, not to Schlachter. 90% of the ex-serfs in the empire who actually gained land after 1861 were confined to the eight western provinces, along with Romania, Polish landless or domestic serfs were the only people eligible for land grants after serfdom was abolished. There's a painting, Farewell to Europe, by Alexander A. Sokachewski. The artist himself is among the exiled here near the obelisk on the right. All this was to punish the Schlachter's role in the uprisings of 1830 and 1863. In addition to the land granted to the peasants, the Russian government gave them forest, pasture and other privileges known under the name of servitudes, which provided to be a source which proved to be a source of incessant irritation between the landowners and peasants over ensuing decades and in and an impediment to economic development. The government took over all church estates and funds and abolished monasteries and convents, with the exception of religious instruction, all teaching in schools was ordered to be in Russian. Russian also became the official language of the country used exclusively in all offices of central and local government. All traces of former Polish autonomy were removed and the kingdom was divided into ten provinces, each with an appointed Russian military governor and all under the control of governor-general in Warsaw. All former Polish government functionaries were deprived of their positions and replaced by Russian officials. According to George Kennan, thousands of Polish insurgents were transported to the Nachinsk silver mining district after the unsuccessful insurrection of 1863. Legacy. These measures of cultural eradication proved to be only partially effective. In 1905, 41 years after Russia crushed the uprising, the next generation of Poles rose once again in the next insurrection. It too failed. The January uprising was one in a centuries-long series of Polish uprisings. In its aftermath, two new movements began to evolve that set the political agenda for the next century one led by the descendant of Lithuanians, Józef Pilsudski, emerged as the Polish Socialist Party. The other, led by Roman Dmowski, became the National Democracy, a movement sometimes referred to as Endekja, whose roots lay in Catholic conservatism that sought national sovereignty along with the reversal of forced Russification and Germanization. 
through polonization of the partitioned territories in the former Commonwealth. There's a gallery of pictures, Alexander Vyalopolsky, Alexander II of Russia, Z. Sirakovsky, Mikhail Moraviov Vilensky, Ludwig Miroslavsky, Julius Cossack, Polish Partisans of 1863 painting, Battle of Vegro, 1863 painting, Russian soldiers looting a Polish manor painting, Chapel in Vilnius, erected to commemorate the crushing of the 1863 January uprising against Russia, picture taken by Sergei Mikhailovich Progurin Gorski, Graves of January Uprising, Veterans at Warsaw, Pawelski Cemetery. Notable insurgents. Picture of Anna Pustovachovna, alias Mikhail Smok. And a picture of the last veterans of the January Uprising photographed in the Second Polish Republic. Franciszek Bahusevich, Belarusian poet and writer of one of the founders of of modern Belarusian literature. Stanislav Broska was a Polish priest and commander at the end of the insurrection. Saint Albert Chmielowski, founder of the Albertine Brothers and Sisters. Jaroslav Dabrowski, officer in the Russian army, left-wing member of the secret committee of officers in St. Petersburg. He took over his leadership from Sierkowski. He died in Paris fighting for the Paris Commune. Konstanty Karnowski was one of the leaders of the Lithuanian and Belarusian National Revival and the leader of the January Uprising in the lands of the former Grand Duke of Lithuania. Saint Raphael Kalinowski, born Joseph Kalinowski in Lithuania, resi resigned as a captain from the Russian army to become Minister of War for the Polish insurgents. He was arrested and sentenced to death by firing squad, but the sentence was then changed to 10 years in Siberia including a gruelling nine-month overland trek to get there. Apollo Korzenowski, Polish playwright and father of Joseph Konrad. Marian Langovic, military commander of the uprising, he had an English wife, Suzanne, next to whom he was buried in Istanbul. Antanas Makavicius, Lithuanian priest who organised some 250 men armed with hunting rifles and straightened scythes. After a defeat near Vikija, he was captured and taken to the prison in Kaunas. After Makavicius refused to betray other leaders of the uprising, he was hanged on December 28, 1863. Ludwig Miroslavski, a veteran of the November Uprising and the Greater Poland Uprising, 1846, general strategist, writer and emigrant with wide foreign contacts. Vladislav Nikolaevski, a liberal Polish politician and member of parliament and insurgent in the Greater Poland Uprisings of 1846 and 48 and on the January 1963 Uprising and a co-founder 1861 of the Central Economic Society, TCL and 1880 the People's Libraries Society, CTG. Francesco Nullo, Italian general who headed the Garibaldi Legion and, through, and though a small it carried huge symbolic value. Nolo died at the Battle of Kriskavka. Boleslav Prus, leading Polish writer of historical novels. Anna Andrika Pustovachovna, alias Michael Smok, adjutant to Marian Langovic, and she was of Russian Polish parentage and an activist from 1861. She later took part in the Paris Commune and the Franco-Prussian War. She died in Paris, the mother of four children. Francois Rochebrun, one of several French officers in the uprising, he formed and led a Polish rebel unit called Zouaves of Death and was promoted to general. Alexander Sojakovsky, Polish painter. Rom Romald Traugut, a lieutenant colonel of German descent in the Russian army, he was promoted general in the insurrection, was its leader for a spell and held the foreign affairs portfolio in the underground government. He was tortured and hanged by the Russians with several of his colleagues. There's a cross commemorating 70th anniversary of the January Uprising. Influence on art and literature. Falling into the late Romantic period, the events and figures of the uprising inspired many Polish painters, including... 
Arthur Grotka, Julius Cossack, and Mikhail Elviro Andreoli, and marked the delineation with the positivism that followed. Polish poet Cyprian Norwid wrote a famous poem, Chopin's Piano, describing the defenestration of the composer's piano during the January 1863 uprising, when Russian soldiers maliciously threw the instrument out of a second-floor Warsaw apartment. Chopin had left Warsaw and Poland forever shortly before the outbreak of the November 1830 uprising. Eliza Orzeszkowa, a leading Polish positivist writer and nominee for the Nobel Prize in Literature, wrote Nad Nimnem, a novel set in and around the city of Grodno, after the 1863 January uprising. Joseph Jarzebowski has put together material from unknown people who lived through the uprising in his Mawia Ludzi Roku 1863, Antologia Niznanich i Niznanich Blah, Voices from 1863, an anthology of unknown and little known contemporary perspectives. In the initial draft of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne, but not in the published version, Captain Nemo was a Polish nobleman whose family had been brutally murdered by the Russians during the January 1863 uprising. Since France had only recently signed an alliance with the Russian Empire, in the novel's final version, Verne's editor, Pierre-Jules Hetzel, made him obscure Nemo's motives. In Guy de Maupassant's novel Pierre et Jean, the protagonist Pierre has a friend, an old Polish chemist who is said to have come to France after the bloody events in his motherland. This story is believed to refer to the January uprising. So so those were the events that led to the International Working Men's Association formation. So I'm going to go now to talk about Congress Poland or Russian Poland, formerly known as the Kingdom of Poland, was a polity created in 1815 by the Congress of Vienna. As a sovereign Polish state, it was established in the Russian sector after Poland was partitioned by the Habsburg monarchy, Russia and Prussia. Until the November uprising in 1831, the kingdom was in a personal union with the Tsars of Russia. Thereafter, the state was forcibly integrated into the Russian Empire over the course of the 19th century. In 1915, during World War I, it was replaced by the Central Powers with the nominal Regency Kingdom of Poland until Poland regained independence in 1918. I think we should go to the Congress of Vienna after this. Religions, Catholicism, Eastern Catholicism, Reformed Lutheran, Russian Orthodox, Polish Orthodox, and Judaism. History, Congress of Vienna, 9th of June, 1815. Constitution adopted 27th of November. November Uprising, 29th of November, 1830. January Uprising, 23rd of January, 1863. Vistula Land, established 1867, lost to Germany during World War I, 1915. Preceded by Duki of Warsaw, today part of Belarus, Lithuania and Poland. Following the partitions of Poland at the end of the 18th century, Poland ceased to exist as an independent state for 123 years. The territory with its native population was split between the Habsburg monarchy, the Kingdom of Prussia and the Russian Empire. After 1804, an equivalent to Congress Poland within the Austrian Empire was the Kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria, 
also commonly referred to as Austrian Poland. The area incorporated into Prussia and subsequently the German Empire had little autonomy and was merely a province, the province of Posen. The Kingdom of Poland enjoyed considerable political autonomy as guaranteed by the liberal constitution. However, its rule of the Russian emperors generally disregarded any restrictions on their power. It was therefore little more than a puppet state of the Russian Empire. The autonomy was severely curtailed following uprisings in 1830 to 31 and 1863, as the country became governed by viceroys and later divided into governorates or provinces. Thus, from the start, Polish autonomy remained little more than fiction. The capital was located in Warsaw, which, towards the beginning of the 20th century, became the Russian Empire's third largest city after St. Petersburg and Moscow. The moderately multicultural population of Congress Poland was estimated at 9,402,253 inhabitants in 1897. It was mostly composed of Poles, Polish Jews, ethnic Germans and a small Russian minority. The predominant religion was Roman Catholicism and the official language used within the state was Polish until the 1863 January Uprising when Russian became co-official. Yiddish and German were widely spoken by their native speakers. The territory of Congress Poland roughly corresponds to modern-day Kalis region and the Lublin, Lodz, Masovian, Podlatsky and Holy Cross voivodeships of Poland as well as southwest Lithuania and part of Grodno district of Belarus. Naming. Although the official name of the state was the Kingdom of Poland, Królestwo Polski, in order to distinguish it from other kingdoms of Poland, it's sometimes referred to as Congress of Poland. The Kingdom of Poland was created out of the Duchy of Warsaw, a French client state at the Congress of Vienna in 1815 when the great powers reorganised Europe following the Napoleonic Wars. The kingdom was created on part of the Polish territory that had been partitioned by Russia, Austria and Prussia, replacing, after Napoleon's defeat, the Duchy of Warsaw. Set up by Napoleon in 1807 after Napoleon's 1812 defeat, the fate of the Duchy of Warsaw was dependent on Russia. Prussia insisted on the Duchy being completely eliminated, but after Russian troops reached Paris in 1812, Tsar Alexander the first originally intended to annex the Duki, the Lithuanian Belarusian lands now controlled by the Sardom, which used to be part of the first Polish Republic, and to unite, thus created Polish county with Russia, country with Russia. Both Austria and the United Kingdom disapproved of that idea, Austria issuing a memorandum on returning to the 1795 resolutions. This idea, supported by the United Kingdom under George IV and Prime Minister Robert Jenkinson, and the British delegate to the Congress, Robert Stuart, Viscount Castlereagh. So, in effect, the Tsar, well, after the so called Hundred Days, established the Kingdom of Poland in the 1815 Congress of Vienna approved. After the Congress, Russia gained a larger share of Poland with Warsaw, and after crushing an insurrection in 1831, the Congress Kingdom's autonomy was abolished and Poles faced confiscation of property, deportation forced military service and the closure of their own universities. The Congress was important enough in the creation of the state to cause the new country to be named for it. The kingdom lost its status as a sovereign state in 1831 and the administrative divisions were reorganised. It was sufficiently distinct that its name remained in official Russian use, although in the later years of Russian rule it was replaced with the Previslinsky Krai. Following the defeat of the November Uprising, its separate institutions and administrative arrangements were abolished as part of the increased Russification to be more closely integrated with the Russian Empire. However, even after this formalised annexation, the territory retained some degree of distinctiveness and continued to be referred to informally as Congress Poland until the Russian rule there ended as a result of the advance of the armies of the Central Powers in 1915 during World War I. Originally, the kingdom had an area of roughly 128,500 kilometres squared and a population of approximately 3.3 million. The new state would be one of the smallest Polish states ever, smaller than the preceding Duchy of Warsaw and much smaller than the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which had a population of 10 million 
and an area of 1 million kilometres squared. Its population reached 6.1 million by 1870 and 10 million by 1900. Most of the ethnic Poles in the Russian Empire lived in the Congress Kingdom, although some areas outside it also contained a Polish majority. The Kingdom of Poland largely re-emerged as a result of the efforts of Adam Jerzy Czartoryski, a Pole who aimed to resurrect the Polish state in alliance with Russia. The Kingdom of Poland was one of the few contemporary constitutional monarchies in Europe, with the Emperor of Russia serving as the Polish King. His title as Chief of Poland in Russia was Tsar, similar to usage in the fully integrated states within the Empire, Georgia, Kazan and Siberia. Initial independence. Theoretically, the Polish Kingdom in 1815 form was a semi-autonomous state in personal union with Russia through the rule of the Russian Emperor. The state possessed the constitution of the Kingdom of Poland, one of the most liberal in 19th century Europe. A SEM parliament was uh, responsible to the king capable of voting laws, an independent army, currency, budget, penal code and customers boundary separating it from the rest of Russian lands. Poland also had democratic traditions, golden liberty and the Polish nobility deeply valued personal freedom. In reality, the kings had absolute power and a formal title of autocrat and wanted no restrictions on their rule. All opposition to the emperor of Russia was suppressed and the law was disregarded at will by Russian officials. Though the absolute rule demanded by Russia was difficult to establish due to Poland's liberal traditions and institutions, the independence of the kingdom lasted only 15 years until Alexander I used the title of King of Poland and was obligated to observe the provisions of the constitution. However, in time, the situation changed and he granted the viceroy Gra Grand Duke Konstantin Pavlovich almost dictatorial powers. Very soon after Congress of Vienna resolutions were signed, Russia ceased to respect them. In 1819, Alexander I abolished freedom of the press and introduced preventary censorship. Resistance to Russian control began in the 1820s. Russian secret police, commanded by Nikolai Nikolaevich Novosilsev, started persecution of Polish secret organizations, and in 1821, the king ordered the abolition of Freemasonry, which represented Poland's patriotic traditions. Beginning in 1825, the sessions of the SEM were held in secret. Uprisings and loss of autonomy. Alexander I's successor, Nicholas I, was crowned King of Poland 24th of May 1829 in Warsaw, but he declined to swear to abide by the constitution and continued to limit the independence of the Polish kingdom. Nicholas's rule promoted the idea of official nationality consisting of orthodoxy, autocracy and nationality. In relation to Poles, these ideas meant assimilation, turning them into loyal orthodox Russians. The principle of orthodoxy was the result of the special role it played in Russian Empire as the church was in fact becoming a department of state and other religions discriminated against. For instance, papal bulls could not be read in the Kingdom of Poland without agreement from the Russian government. The rule of Nicholas also meant end of political traditions in Poland. Democratic institutions were removed and appointed rather than elected. Centralized administration was put in place and efforts were made to change the relations between the state and the individual. All of this led to discontent and resistance among the Polish population. In January 1831, the SEM disposed Nicholas I as King of Poland in response to his repeated curtailing of its constitutional rights. Nicholas reacted by sending Russian troops into Poland, resulting in the November uprising. Following an 11-month military campaign, the Kingdom of Poland lost its semi-independence and was integrated much more closely with the Russian Empire. This was formalised through the issuing of the Organic Statute of the Kingdom of Poland by the Emperor in 1832, which abolished the Constitution, Army and Legislative Assembly. Over the next 30 years, a series of measures bound Congress Poland ever more closely to Russia. In 1863, the January Uprising broke out, but lasted only two years before being crushed. As a direct result, any remaining separate status of the kingdom was removed and the political entity was directly incorporated into the Russian Empire. The unofficial name, Privyslinski Krai, Russian Vistula Land, 
replaced Kingdom of Poland as the area's official name, and the area became a Namastnictwo under the control of Namistnik until 1875, when it became a gubernia. The Government of Congress Poland was outlined in the Constitution of the Kingdom of Poland in 1915. The Emperor of Russia was the official head of state considered King of Poland with the local government headed by Viceroy of the Kingdom of Poland, Council of State and Administrative Council in addition to the Sen. In theory, Congress Poland possessed one of the most liberal governments of the time in Europe, but in practice the area was a puppet state of the Russian Empire. Liberal provisions of the constitution and the scope of the autonomy were often disregarded by the Russian officials. Polish remained an official language until the mid-1860s when it was replaced by Russian. This resulted in bilingual street signs and documents. However, the full implementation of Cyrillic script into the Polish language failed. Executive leadership. The office of Namistnik was introduced in Poland by the 1815 Constitution of Congress Poland. The Viceroy was chosen by the King from among the noble citizens of the Russian Empire or the Kingdom of Poland. The Viceroy supervised the entire public administration and, in the monarch's absence, chaired the Council of State as well as the Administrative Council. He could veto the Council's decisions. Other than that, his decisions had to be countersigned by the appropriate government minister. The Viceroy exercised broad powers and could nominate candidates for most senior government posts, ministers, senators, judges of the High Tribunal, councillors of state, referendaries, bishops and archbishops. He had no competence in the realms of finances and foreign policy. His military competence varied. The office of Namistnik or Viceroy was never abolished. However, after the January 1863 uprisings, it disappeared. The last Namistnik was Friedrich Wilhelm Rembert von Berg, who served from 1863 to his death in 1874. No Namistnik was named to replace him. However, the role of Namistnik Viceroy of the former kingdom passed to the Governor General of Warsaw, or to be more specific, of the Warsaw Military District. The Governor General answered directly to the Emperor and exercised much broader powers than had the Namistnik. In particular, he controlled all the military forces in the region, oversaw the judicial systems. He could impose, impose death sentences without trial. He could also issue declarations with force of law, which could alter existing laws. Administrative Council. The Administrative Council was a part of the Council of State of the Kingdom introduced by the Constitution of the Kingdom of Poland in 1815. It was composed of five ministers, special nominees of the king and the viceroy of the Kingdom of Poland. The council executed the king's will and ruled in the cases outside the minister's competence and prepared projects for the Council of State. Administrative divisions of the kingdom changed several times over its history and various smaller reforms were also carried out, which either changed the smaller administrative units or merged, split various subdivisions. Immediately after its creation in 1815, the Kingdom of Poland was divided into departments, a relic from the times of the French-dominated Duchy of Warsaw. On 16 January 1816, the administrative division was reformed with the departments being replaced with more traditionally Polish voivodeships, of which there were eight obwards and powiats. On 7 March 1837, in the aftermath of the November uprising earlier that decade, the administrative division was reformed again, bringing Congress Poland closer to the structure of the Russian Empire. With the introduction of Gubernias, governor at Polish spelling Gubernia, in 1842, the Powiats were renamed Okregs and the Obvods were renamed Powiats. In 1844, several governorates, governorates were merged with others and some others were renamed. Five governorates remained. In 1867, following the failure of the January Uprising, further reforms were instituted which were designed to bring to the administrative structure of Poland, now de facto, the Vistulin country, closer to that of the Russian Empire. It divided larger governorates into smaller ones, introduced the Gmina, a new lower level entity, and restructured the existing five governorates into ten. The 1912 reform created a new governorate, Kolm governorate, form 
from parts of the Sedlets and Lublin governorates. It was split off from the Vistulum country and made part of the southwestern cry of the Russian Empire. Economy Despite the fact that the economic situation varied at times, Congress Poland was one of the largest economies in the world. In the mid-1800s, the region became heavily industrialized. However, agriculture still maintained a major role in the economy. In addition, the export of wheat, rye and other crops was significant in stabilizing the financial output. An important trade partner of Congress Poland was the Russian Empire, and the Russian Empire was Great Britain, which imported goods in large amounts. Since agriculture was equivalent to 70% of the national income, the most important economic transformations included the establishment of mines and the textile industry. The development of these sectors brought more profit and higher tax revenues. The beginnings were difficult due to floods and intense diplomatic relationship with Prussia. It was not until 1822 when Prince Francis Xavier Druki Lubecki negotiated to open the Polish market to the world. He also tried to introduce appropriate protective duties. A large and profitable investment was the construction of the Augustov Canal connecting Nauru and Niman rivers, which allowed to bypass Danzig and high Prussian tariffs. Druki Lubecki also founded the Bank of Poland, for which he is mostly remembered. The first Polish steam mill was built in 1828 in Warsaw Solek. The first textile machine was installed in 1829. Greater use of machines led to the production in the form of workshops. The government was also encouraging foreign specialists, mostly Germans, to upkeep larger establishments or to undertake production. The Germans were also relieved of tax burden. This allowed to create one of the largest European textile centres in Lodz and in its surrounding towns like or Ozorkov and Zdunska Vola. These small and, and initially insignificant settlements later developed into larger multicultural cities where Germans and Jews were the majority in the population. With the abolition of border customs in 1851 and further economic growth, Polish cities were gaining wealth and importance, most notably Warsaw being associated with the construction of railway lines and bridges gained priority in the entire Russian market. Although the econ economic and industrial progress occurred rapidly, most of the farms, called followwalks, chose to rely on serfs and paid workforce. Only a few have experimented by obtaining proper machinery and ploughing equipment from England. New crops were being cultivated like sugar beet, which marked the beginning of Polish sugar refineries. The use of iron cutters and ploughs was also favoured among the farmers. During the January uprising, the occupying authorities sought to deprive peasant insurgents of their popularity among landed gentry. Taxes were raised and the overall economic situation of commoners worsened. The noblemen and landowners were, on the other hand, privileged, provided with more privileges, rights and even financial support in the form of bribery. The aim of this was to weaken their support for the rebellion against the Russian Empire. Congress Poland was the largest supplier of zinc in Europe. The development of zinc industry took place at the beginning of 19th century. It was mostly caused by the significant increase of demand for zinc, mainly in industrialized countries of Western Europe. In 1899, Alexander Ginzburg founded the company FOS, factory of op optical equipment in Warsaw. It was the only firm in the Russian Empire which crafted and produced cameras, telescopes, objectives and stereoscopes. Following the outbreak of World War I, the factory was moved to St. Petersburg. And then it goes to demographics. Composition in 1897 by language. Polish 71.8%, Jewish 13.5%, German 4.3%, Ukrainian 3.6%, Lithuanian 3.2%, Russian 2.8%, Belarusian 0.3%.